Thanks once again, everyone, uh, especially for bearing with us the difficulties that are posed by um, lockdown and now the restrictions that we have in Western Australia. And we'll go over to you, um, Samia. Thank you, Sam, very much for having me here today. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you in person today. Um, so I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we are meeting on here today, the Nonga people. Pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and bear witness to the truth that sovereignty has never been ceded. Uh, so back in 2016, when I was in a family visit to Gaza, I met with Dr. Ayman Abu Rauf at the Shifa Hospital, the main hospital in Gaza. Abu Rauf was one of the doctors uh, supervising my mother's cancer treatment. Um, in fact, due to his humorous nature, he was my mother's favorite doctor. His comforting voice and smile, however, could not hide the fact that there was nothing he could do about my mother's condition. Her condition was deteriorating and she needed regular scans and radio treatment that were unavailable in any hospital in Gaza. Waiting for weeks or months uh, for Israeli permits to be treated at the hospital in the West Bank, some of which would be refused for no particular reason, meant limiting her chances of surviving. But for my mother, at least, Dr. Abelhoff was not so grim about it. Last May, as I was watching and following the updates from home, I came across Dr. Ayman's name and photo again. He was killed in his own house, along 14 members of his family. Only his 18-year-old son survived the bombing, which leveled his house to the ground. His house was two kilometers away from his workplace, the main hospital in Gaza. That bombing resulted in the killing of innocent lives of one of Gaza's most notable doctors, who at the time was acting as the head of the coronavirus response at Shifa Hospital. But it also led to the destruction of the street, leading to the main hospital during the Israeli aggression on Gaza. And according to Physicians for Human Rights, in the first week of the ceasefire, Israel has rejected 90% of applications by Palestinian patients for exit permits from Gaza for, for urgent medical care. So when mainstream media starts to pick up the news and to perpetuate what's happening in Gaza, my hometown, as a complicated, never-ending conflict and as another round of violence between Hamas and Israel, I think of the story of my mother, who did not survive her cancer, of Dr. Ayman, who did not survive the bombing, and of the, rub the rubble-ridden street leading to the hospital as examples of the structural violence that Palestinians in Gaza face on a daily basis. Israeli killing of Palestinians in Gaza does not only happen with the large-scale aggressions that have recently resulted in the obliterating of whole families under their own homes, again. The recent assault on Gaza has resulted in the killing of 253 Palestinians, including 66 children, and the deliberate destruction of crucial infrastructure, medical clinics, cultural spaces, and media offices, while Gaza was still recovering from Israel's previous bombing of 2014. However, this violence is not episodic. Now, in the past, Israel has perpetrated such claims like the Israeli against Gaza was another violent confrontation with Hamas or under the pretense of self-defense. This time, I think, Israel was struggling to sustain that argument and to disconnect the narrative about its crimes in Gaza from the overall, uh, uh, from the overall events taking place in Palestine as a whole, in the West Bank, East Jerusalem and 48 Palestine. And while Israel brutally bombed the Gaza Strip, which has suffered the 15-year-old blockade that sealed it off from the rest of the world and denied its residents, 70% of whom are refugees, access to life-saving medicine, food and electricity and clean water, all eyes were still on Sheikh Jarrah and the threat to forcefully displace its residents. 
This Palestinian neighborhood in East Jerusalem, and like all of occupied East Jerusalem, has been under Israeli military occupation since 1957. But on Sunday, the 2nd of May, an Israeli court ruled in Israeli settlers' favor to evict the Palestinian families living in Sheikh Jarrah and take ownership of their homes. An example of Israeli state-sanctioned ethnic cleansing. These evictions are part of a wider Israeli push to change the demographics of Jerusalem by removing Palestinians and replacing them with Israeli Jewish settlers. And Sheikh Jarrah has long been coveted by Israeli settlers. In 2009, for example, settlers evicted three families from their homes in the neighborhood. And for the past few months, Israeli settlers have been trying to take over Palestinian homes in Sheikh Jarrah. And today, more than 200 Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah still face face forced eviction. And for the past three months, we have watched as Palestinian peaceful protesters in Sheikh Jarrah are met with violence, and as Israel continues to block all entrances, all, all, all entry, entries to the neighborhood in an attempt to block media coverage of those protests. But Sheikh Jarrah is not the only neighborhood in Jerusalem with its residents facing displacement. Palestinians in the neighborhood of Silwan are also facing a similar fate. 230 Palestinian families uh, face ethnic cleansing from their homes in Silwan. Recent demolition orders were distri distributed by occupation municipality in, of Jerusalem in Al Bustan neighborhood in, in the Silwan village, and the order asked the residents to leave their homes within 21 days. They, they even had the guts to ask the, the residents to demolish their own houses or pay for the demolition bills. And in Israel, on the other hand, while Palestinian citizens of Israel were forming popular committees to protect their homes from attacks by Israeli ultranationalists and settlers, Israeli authorities were conducting mass arrests inside Israel targeting Palestinians. In May 2000, and, uh, in May uh, the 23rd, Israel launched its Operation Law and Order, a campaign of mass arrests of Palestinian citizens of Israel who protested Israeli assault on Gaza, ethnic cleansing in Sheikh Jarrah, and attacks on Al-Aqsa Mosque. Israel police arrested more than 1,500 Palestinians. At least 70% were Palestinian citizens of Israel. All of these events spiked around the time Palestinians commemorate their Nakba, or the catastrophe of 1948. And despite the various significant historical events and moments present in the collective memory of Palestinians preceding 1948, including, for example, the Balfour Declaration or the, uh, the anti-colonial struggle against the British Mandate or the United Nations Partition Plan, um, the Nakba remains the most traumatic site. It represents in a point in Palestinian history when Palestinians' notions of place, time, and identity were disrupted. That year resulted in the destruction of over 450 Palestinian villages and towns and resulted in the fragmentation of the Palestinian nation and the displacement of two-thirds of its population. That's why it's preserved its central location as an important site of collective memory. And for Palestinians, separated by geography, fragmented internally and globally, or residing within the boundaries of the Israeli state, the memory of the Nakba continues to connect these Palestinians, despite their different geographical and political contexts today. But since 1948, the Nakba that we mourn and commemorate is not just a historical event, but an ongoing reality facing Palestinians everywhere. And Edward Said uh, argues that, and I'm quoting him, perhaps the greatest battle Palestinians have waged as a people has been over the right to a remembered presence. And without presence, the right to possess and reclaim a collective historical reality. End of quote. Now, these recent events were a stark reminder that for the past 73 years, we have seen how the geography of Palestine has been persistently diminished by the colonial confiscation of Palestinian land. Today, Israel continues with its annexation of lands in the West Bank, and the settlement expansion has meant increasing the number of Israeli-only road networks and buffer zones, 
In addition, the ongoing building of the separation wall by Israel resulted in the annexation of more Palestinian land and has led to the ghettoization of many Palestinian cities and villages, preventing the possibility of establishing a viable Palestinian state. The wall functions not only as an ethnic separation line, singling those of, out those of different ethnicity or different religion, but it also disconnects the Palestinian people from the outside world and, trap it, and traps them into isolated Bantu stands. These, along the recent events, are few manifestations of the way Palestinians perceive their daily reality as a continuation of the Nakba and the displacement and the disposition. These have all been factors that have led to such mass protests across Palestine, whether in Gaza, in the West Bank, or in Israel. As a Palestinian who was scared her for her family in Gaza, I was still extremely proud to see a unified narrative which works against Israel's long attempt, attempts and policies and practices of fragmentations. I have also been touched by the protests erupting around the world during a pandemic, demanding an end to Israeli occupation and apartheid. These photos were very empowering, and I'm confident that they have also contributed to sustaining the steadfastness of Palestinians inside Palestine as they creatively rose to resist their ongoing displacement. However, such beautiful unified grassroots resistance was not reflected in our Palestinian political re leadership. And today we are reminded that our struggle for freedom and justice in Palestine is one of liberation from settler colonialism, of tyranny, from tyranny and domestic corruption. On the 25th of June, Palestinian security officers stormed the House of Palestinian activist Nizar Banat, and Nizar was severe, severely beaten during his arrest and died, died while in custody of the PA, of the Palestinian Authority, on the same day. Banat was one of the most outspoken critics of the Palestinian Authority and was arrested on multiple occasions, but was never charged. And his death was a shock to all of us Palestinians, especially to us activists, reminding every one of us that our struggle is a struggle against political persecu persecution, subjugation, and assassination, regardless whether it is carried out by Israel or by the Palestinian Authority. It is also a reminder that dismantling settler colonialism or colonial structures means dismantling corrupt and oppressive regimes that sustains this status quo. So how do we build on such a momentum inside of Palestine as a solidarity group here? For us, Palestinians, international solidarity means a lot because we often feel as though the world has turned their back on us. So raising your voice against while the, the silence brings, brings, us, brings us hope. As Palestinians, we appreciate solidarity that does not negate our agency, one that works towards building pressure on Israel to abide by international laws. Therefore, write to your parliamentarians, or even better, visit their offices, ask that our govern, government apply concrete pressure on Israel to begin respecting Palestinian human rights and international laws, and to immediately stop the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from Jerusalem. Ask your representatives to use their position to demand that Palestinian rights are respected under international law and that Israel is held to account for violations of international law. Hold the media to account. Write letters to your newspaper of choice, comment on articles, and if necessary, report serious uh, concerns to Media Watch. Watch as a Palestinian from Gaza, I have witnessed firsthand the complete media blackout over what's happening in Palestine, here in Australia. The, me the media is partially interested in our voices when there is a large-scale assault. And our narrative is always exploited for the sake of a persistent mainstream story of the too complicated conflict. They are also explo exploited in segments where our voices have always been uh, have always uh, have to always be balanced with Israeli voices for the sake of objectivity. A few days after the ceasefire, a leading newspaper that I thought was very objective and balanced cancelled a podcast they arranged with me because, as they claimed, the story was outdated. 
So demand that the Palestinian voices be heard and represented in media. Of course, boy boycott, sanction, and and uh, uh, boycott, divest, and sanction is an important Palestinian call. So spread the word and share credible information on your so social media. Connect with Palestinian journalists on social media. Talk to your family and friends about what you've, um, what uh, what's happening, and continue the conversation because your solidarity matters. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you very much, Samia. And I don't know if you can hear it, but you've got a big round of applause here in the uh, in the thank room, which was great. And thank you also for for just bringing to to sharp attention the, the the intensity of the suffering that people suffer in Gaza, in particular. Which, despite the recent coverage in our media, you'd have to say most Australians are still fairly ignorant of or, or, or oblivious to. Um, I think it was very useful as well that you you touch on the fact that in this most recent round of the escalation of the conflict, we've seen a coming together of, of all, all the strands of, of Palestinian society um, in resistance to Israeli, Israeli occupation and, and dispossession, whether they are people within the boundaries of 48 or 67, refugees, Gaza, wherever they are, which I think is a very interesting thing. Uh, something for people to reflect on as well um, is before our discussion this afternoon, uh, Jason and I were discussing just sort of informally the the similarities and differences between the struggle against apartheid and in South Africa and the struggle of Palestinian people. Um, many of the leading uh, South African uh, anti-apartheid figures, such as Archbishop Tutu and others, say that say that the conditions suffered by the Palestinians today is actually worse than apartheid. Um, so there are definite similarities, but there are also differences, different strengths and weaknesses. That might be something to, to, to sort of stimulate discussion when we get there. So I'll, we'll go now to um, Vivian Pozolt, who I briefly mentioned, introduced before, um, who for as long as I can remember has been um, a Jewish activist, um, loudly and strongly explaining the fact that Israel does not speak for all Jewish people. Um, some of you will be aware of the fact that she attempted to join one of the flotillas to Gaza um, that, was, that was prevented. I think one boat got through, but not Vivian's. She, she was prevented from, from, from um, making that sea voyage to Gaza. Uh, and she, she might tell the story herself, but I believe she then tried to fly and got, got, turned, got turned back at the airport um, at Tel Aviv. So now um, over to you, uh, Vivian, if you could give us your take on things, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Sam, and greetings to, to all of you. I'm speaking here in Sydney uh, on the land of the Gathering people of the Order This land is strong. This injustice can only be resolved with a treaty signed as recognised equal partners. I must say, I'm feeling quite optimistic about the possibilities of peace in Palestine, Israel. This may seem strange when the situation on the ground for Palestinians has not improved at all. The removal of Palestinians to be uh, replaced by Jews in their Jerusalem homes continues. There are massive arrests of Palestinian citizens of Israel um, who had the temerity to protest in solidarity with their fellow Palestinians in Jerusalem. The bombing of Gaza continues intermittently. It is only called peace when Israeli Jews are not being attacked. So what reason can there be for optimism? The global response to the Israel attack on Gaza has been unprecedented. In the wake of the murder of George Floyd, so graphically beamed around the world, there has been a massive movement for the rights of people of colour. This has linked with the battle for Indigenous rights, as we have seen here in Australia. And the Black Lives Matter movement has proudly hitched its wagon to the cause of Palestine. Building on this massive worldwide movement, solidarity action for Palestine has been renewed. A major development has been this, an amazing display of Palestinian unity. In the face of repression by Israel and Hamas and the Palestinian Authority and the fragmentation of the Palestinian Arab parties in Israel, Palestinian people have protested. They have asserted their unity and protest and power. And it is young Palestinians who are leading and driving this movement. But not only young Palestinians are on the march. 
young Jews, especially in the US, are throwing off the shackles of the brainwashing they have been subjected to in their day schools. They are rejecting Zionism and Jewish nationalism that contradicts the fundamentals of Judaism. In the US, Jewish Voice for Peace has built itself into a formidable organization. Bay Street, the coalition of liberal organized and Zionist organizations, was founded in opposition to APAC. The uh, America Israel Public Affairs Committee has also um, grown from strength to strength. While it is liberal, Zionist, and thoroughly pro Israel, it presents a, a division in the Israel lobby that weakens it as a whole. It has stopped the extreme right wing APAC from holding total sway over policy in regard to Israel if not yet in Washington, then over the wider public and the way they understand the situation. The rise of the progressive representatives in Congress is a testament to this shift. There has been a sh big shift in views within the liberal Zionist camp. Prominent among them is leading liberal Zionist US academic Peter Beinart. He has recently published two essays, Yavne, a Jewish case for equality in Israel-Palestine, and Teshuva, a Jewish case for Palestinian return. Now, these are very strongly um, not Zionist positions, and not political Zionist positions. Because Zionists have been such a strong advocate for Zionism. Similarly, the respected Israeli human rights group, B'Tselem, has recently issued a paper declaring Israel to be an apartheid state. Contrary to many, I think, liberal Zionists, liberal Zionists are the weak link in Jewish support for Zionism. This is because the historical reality of Israel directly conflicts with their sincere liberal democratic values. Jewish history has provided emotional support for the Zionist rationale for the need for Jews to have their own state. This need is justified in their eyes by the, the this justifies in their eyes the dispossession of the Palestinians to create and maintain it. Jewish felt security needs are in direct conflict with their democratic values. This is of liberal Zionists. This creates a deep cognitive dissonance which is challenged by the actions of the State of Israel. I have gone into this issue in this detail because I think the near unanimity of Jewish support for Israel has been a major plank in, in, in its existence. Any weakening of this unanimity weakens this support, including its legitimacy. That is why the Zionist establishment attacks critical Jews so furiously. They know Jewish criticism weakens the hold of Zionism among Jews and non-Jews alike, and anything beyond anything Palestinian criticism may do. Here in Australia, too, young Jews are getting organized. In Australia, the, uh, in Sydney, they have formed a group Tzedek, meaning justice. In Melbourne, a new group Loud Jews has formed. Also in Sydney, the existing organizations, Jews Against the Occupation and Independent Australian Jewish Voices, are joining with CEDEC to form a diverse network to work together on common projects. A young Jewish filmmaker, Keir Kranko, has made a film in dialogue on a film called In Dialogue, Jews on the Borderlands. This features Jews who do not share the enforced Zionist consensus. And Human Rights Watch, a very middle-of-the-road organization, has also declared Israel to be an apartheid state. So this tsunami of challenges to Zionism has massively weakened the power of the Israel lobby. Already with the recent attacks, we saw more Palestinian voices in the media than previously. They are not enough, and the tension you know, wanders away once the immediate evident crisis is over. But it is an important development. The Executive Council of the Australian Jury met with the ABC recently. They wanted to register their furious protest at the Q&A session that involved a lot more criticism of Israel than has previously been allowed. They had issued a media release which apparently grossly misrepresented the outcomes of that meeting. The ABC issued an unusually forthright response denying this version of events. They pointedly stated that they were meeting with APAN, the, the national group Australian-Palestine Advocacy Network. There are also cracks appearing in the hitherto tight bipartisan positions of the major political parties in Australia to, to the Zionist project. Despite strong Zionist elements within the ALP, 
it has voted to recognize the state of Palestine if they become government. This is not a question of taking a position on the one state, two stage debate. The shift in AR policy adds weight to the legitimacy of the Palestinian cause. In addition, 22 members of parliament spoke out against the Israeli attacks on Gaza. This is unprecedented. This shift diminishes the power of the Israel lobby as their furious opposition to the shift attests. The lobby is getting more and more shrill and desperate as they, are, as they see their power waning. So, given this global shift in regard to Israel, what is the way forward? The obvious answer overall is BDS, boycotts, divestment and sanctions of Israel until it abides by international law. This has already had some successes, but faces furious, well-organized opposition by the lobby. The success of BDS is not so much its economic power, but the threat it poses of the delegitimization, quote, quote, of Israel. For this reason, Israel devotes considerable resources through its Ministry of Strategic Affairs and Public Diplomacy to challenging and misrepresenting it. This is because Israel's power until now has not been based on any material force it can mobilize, but on its legitimacy. Its major plank of opposition is that BDS is anti-Semitic. They have recently seized on the so-called non-legally binding working definition of anti-Semitism issued by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IHRA, an intergovernmental organization. While this definition was not developed for the purpose of a legal definition of anti-Semitism, as is specifically titled as such, the Israeli Ministry for Strategic Affairs has worked zealously to have it adopted by various organizations at all levels. If BDS delegitimizes Israel, then the strategic use of the IHA definition is their efforts to delegitimize the Palestinians' voice and their experience. Prominent human rights barrister Jeffrey Robinson has declared it not fit for purpose as a definition of anti-Semitism and inconsistent with freedom of political speech. So BDS has had some defeats and a number of victories, as has Israel's use of the IHA definition. It is an ongoing struggle. It must go on in the political parties, the unions, the churches, community groups in general. The question of whether peace should be one democratic state or two states or a unitary state or a federation or confederation is not really our business. It must be left to the parties concerned. It is a pres at present, it is a moot point anyway, as these possibilities are not exactly on the horizon. I think the most likely is that we now, is what we now have, de facto, a single apartheid state from the river to the sea. So our struggle must be, just as with South Africa, a struggle for human and national rights in that area. And the three basic demands of the BDS campaign are, ending Israel's occupation and colonization of all Arab lands and dismantling the wall, recognizing the fundamental rights of the Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel to full equality, and respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. If we base ourselves on these basic human rights and build on the current momentum, we will win. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vivian. That was a great presentation. And I think um, I want to thank you in particular for, for two things. One, for drawing our attention to the fact that although the situation on the ground remains grim and desperate for the Palestinians, that there has been a shift. How big that shift we, we can debate, but there's definitely been a shift in the way the, the Israeli dispossession of the Palestinian people is, is, is conceived of uh, globally. And the fact that um, essentially the, the ability to, to um, use the, 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 the stick of anti-Semitism to beat any criticism um, is, is, is weakening. That said, we should also not lose sight of the fact that uh, it was used to, to great effect against uh, former British Labor leader, Jeremy Corbyn, in a country, in a country like France that I'm familiar with. Um, it's actually illegal um, to promote BDS. So the BDS campaign in France, for instance, has to base its website outside of France. So there's still, there's still a long way to go. Um, so the next speaker is going to be Jason Dumini. Um, as Jason described himself as a, a, a renewable energy entrepreneur, uh, 
Palestinian activist and Palestinian Christian, and I, I know he's very passionate about um, asking the question, we know what's wrong and what we're against, but what, what, what do we need to replace it with? What the Palestinians need in order to go future? So over to you, Jason. Thank you so much, Sam. So, and thank you so much for the, to the other two speakers that spoke really wonderfully on the subject. Um, hi, my name is Jason. I am of Palestinian Christian heritage. Um, my surname, Damuni, actually comes from a town called Al Damun, which is two kilometers northwest of uh, Nazareth. Um, and it's, it's funny because growing up in a place like Australia, um, I went to Wesley College, which is an all boy uh, uniting church school. And uh, for the most part, everyone thought that I was Muslim because I was Arab. Um, uh, I would remember I, I would uh, I used to do rowing as a sport, and like after each each event, we would have afters. And at when when uh, after a rowing event, I'd be drinking, and I'd have friends come to me like Jason, why are you drinking? I thought you weren't allowed to drink. And I said, what do you mean? It's like, aren't you Muslim? I said, no, I'm Christian. Oh, I didn't realize that there were Christians over there. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought you were part of the city. I'm like, that's right. It's like, when did your family come? Oh. Come on back. Oh, hang on a second. There we go. Where, where did you, where, where did you start off? Sorry? Sorry, Jason. That was my fault. So you were just... Yeah, far away. Yeah, so people, as a, as a pastor, you're Christian here, when you're faced with the question, when did your family convert? It's like, okay, how, how do you not realize this? And it's because of the decades of, of media sort of being one-sided. Now with the internet, we're, we're getting, we're, it's becoming more of a level playing field. People are able to access things that they wouldn't be exposed to about 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So we're, look, I, I, I am a Palestinian human rights activist. I'm a peace activist. Uh, I want to see a future where I can actually go back and have somewhat of the same opportunity that I have in Australia back in my place of indigenous origin. So Palestinian Christians, um, like some Palestinian Muslims, actually descend from ethnic Jews that converted to Christianity during the time of Jesus. Jesus' first followers uh, were, were from the Essene community of Judaism during Second Temple Judaism. Um, and so... Uh, in during the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt, all right, which was the Jewish revolt against uh, the Roman occupation, which inevitably led to the expulsion of the Jewish people and our Jewish cousins uh, by the Emperor Hadrian, um, they only expelled the religious Jews. The Jews that practiced Christianity, the Jews that had apostated from Judaism to follow Jesus, there is a specific verse in the Bible in Matthew 22 that says, Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God's what is God's. The Christians were very took a pacifistic approach to the Roman occupation of the time, and in doing so, they were spared from being expelled from the land. Um, and uh, after 300 years later, the Rome actually took on Christianity as its religion. And there was a Byzantine Christian Arabic-speaking empire from there. There was even uh, a, a, a Roman emperor that came from. Uh, the Levant region called Philip the Arab, who was an Arabic-speaking Christian that made himself all the way up to the top seat in, in Rome. And, and this is sort of left out of public consciousness, and this is not common knowledge. Um, so uh, during um, uh, the 7th century, in, in 1937, uh, Umar bin Khattab, through the Islamic conquest, came to uh, the region and, and conquered Jerusalem. Uh, and there was a great treaty that was done between the Christian patriarch Sophronius and Omar bin Khattab, uh, which essentially uh, spelled out to the minorities of the region that although this would be an Islamic civilization, Christian and Jewish rights will be preserved, and hence you still have the ecclesiastical church and the halakhic church in the old city that still exists today. Um, so... To give a more nuanced, uh, uh, or, or to give a brief history of the conflict, this is a unique, this is, a, it's not even conflict, this is a unique situation, right? It, it's the only situation in the world where, where people ask the non-existent country to recognize the right of the existing country to exist. Like, imagine a dead, like a, a, a living person complaining to a dead person, 
society hasn't recognized our right to live. Like let that thought you know, sink in. So the only scenario in the world where something like this uh, happens. And, and most, people are, most people are clueless about the conflict. People think it has something to do with differences in culture, ethnicity, and mainly religion. You, you often hear, you know, Islamic Jihad. Everyone thought I was Muslim because all they knew about Palestinians was Islamic extremists and Hamas rockets and uh, et cetera, and things like that. But if you actually just, the, 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 it's, it's, it's very in the open. So I'd like to um, put a slide on because the, the, the essence of the conflict and what I'd like a lot of people to understand is actually demography. Uh, demographics has been the key uh, root of, of the conflict because at the beginning of Zionism in 1882, the population of Jewish people in historic Palestine was only 8%. So there was no plan as to what to do with the other 92%. There was no, uh, it, it, it was, and, and that these population ratios remained from 1882 all up to 1917 and to the Balfour Declaration. So when England made, made it policy to support the creation of a Jewish state on top of historic Palestine, 92% of the population was not Jewish. 22% were Christian and approximately 70% were Muslim, and these people naturally felt anxious about being reversed into a minority. Because being a minority, so if we go to the next next tab, you can see here uh, in 1882, uh, the the total of uh, Jewish percentage of the population was eight percent, and you go down to 1918, which is after the Balfour Declaration, it's still eight percent. Um, now. If we could go uh, to the next tab. So this particular piece of text can be found in the National Library of Australia. Chaim Simons, who's a rabbi, writes this book called International Proposals to Transfer Arabs from Palestine, 1895 to 1947. So anyone that tells you that you know uh, the the depopulation of Palestinian villages was only a consequence of war was a consequence of Arabs starting the war clearly does not know about the proposals beginning since 1895. However, this was not common knowledge amongst most Zionists, despite the majority of the Jewish population being against Zionism during the time of 1882. Herzl was a secular Jew in Eastern Europe that just didn't care about the orthodox prophecy of waiting for the Messiah to return to be able to go and establish a country, right? So, um, uh, uh, and in response to his idea, uh, to the pamphlet Judenstadt, um, uh, it was met with hostility amongst most orthodox and uh, organizations and people saying, you know, how, you know, I mean, this is, this is defying the prophecy. This is defying the prophecy. And then, in a sense, those communities will tell other communities, you know, what these secular Jews are doing uh, in historic Palestine, that's, that's wrong, that's against our religion. This is the time of early uh, Zionism. Um, uh, now, what happens is, during that period of time, um, um, that uh, once, when anti-Semitism in Europe increases, and it was very, very rampant in Western, in, in, in Western countries, including the United States. Um, uh, there's, there's another tab that I've put over, over there, if we could go to um, this one here, the internet, the, where it says the international, uh, the third tab, the third last tab, third last tab. So, so this is called the International Jew. This was, a, this was pamphlets written by Henry Ford after the Balfour Declaration. You know, what I mean? so the, the anti-Semitism in Europe was increasing like uh, crazy, and obviously with with Hitler, the, it's, the, it's we don't need like everyone knows what happened to Jews in that uh, region of the world. So now, if you go back to the very last tab here. Uh, during this, this is a rabbi, he's a very famous rabbi called Rav Cooks, is his nickname, right? And during his era, right, because of the increase in anti-Semitism in Europe, during Rav Cooks' time, he was one of the many people that consolidated secular and orthodox thought in order to enable the majority of Jewish people to become Zionists. And the, the, the idea was, 
well, if God, uh, if God has allowed these secular Jews to go and establish you know, Tel Aviv, like because the, like the majority of Jewish people were still against Zionism up until the, uh, up until the point Tel Aviv was even established. So if, when Rav, by the time Rav Cooks comes around, he's like, okay, well, uh, uh, if the secular Jews, if God has allowed these secular Jews to go and create Tel Aviv, he's clearly working through human hands. And then secular and uh, orthodox thought was consolidated and along with, with, with the push of anti-Semitism and the need to escape Europe, um, the majority of Jewish thinking flipped to being pro-Zionist. Now, if we could go back um, to those uh, um, demographics, uh, so the, if we could go back to the uh, Jewish non-Jewish population chart, um, you see here, uh, you, you see the only way that you can achieve uh, a Jewish country was to establish a Jewish demographic majority. Okay, the early Zionists knew this, and they knew that just immigration alone is not going to cut it, right? So Chaim Simons, who documents these in, in his uh, documentation of all the international proposals, who's, who, and Chaim Simons, remember, is not a, um, he's not an Elon Pape, he's not a Noam Chomsky, he's not documenting these proposals as, look at how they've, look, look at this clear evidence of them trying to displace you know, uh, Palestinians, how terrible. He doesn't write this book in this term. Chaim Simons is an ardent Zionist that documents these proposals in justification of them. You know, so it's, it's very, very clear to see that, hang on a second, this was not an unintentional displacement or a cause of war that we were depopula depopulated. This was something that a group of people knew at the very beginning and realized that most, Jew most Jewish people that were in Europe facing anti-Semitism would be apathetic or they didn't have, were either being fed misinformation that the land was empty or that they, they, out of, they were driven out of necessity to wanting to go and establish Israel. Now, that's, that, that, that is, and so when you have, like on the basis of that, when we still see things like evictions happening, forced evictions happening, Palestinians will see it as a continuation of what Chaim Simons documents since 1895, although this is marketed as a real estate dispute. They, they, they say that, oh, you know, they, they, these Jewish families have documents from the Ottoman and the British period that they've bought these, uh, that they've bought these lands. But hang on a second. My grandparents have British deeds of titles and document documents for properties that we own in Haifa. But my, I can't go to an Israeli district court and have the current Jewish occupants either forced to pay me rent or being forcefully evicted out of there. That, that, is, that is the issue. Plus, among policies that continuously advocate for the judification of East Jerusalem, and you, you don't even need to hear it from me, you can look at video clips of the settlers themselves saying that they want to go from this house to that house to that house. Why? To, 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 to reverse the demographics of, of Jerusalem to make it in order to make it a Jewish state. That's how the country. So, um, there is a there is there is other bit of history that I'd like to to put forward because when people often misunderstand this as a religious conflict and 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 you you know you often hear oh you know the Muslims and Jews they've been fighting for you know thousands of years nothing could be further from you know nothing could be further from the truth and I would like every for everyone online if they see that if we could go to this tab um, okay let's go to the one that says speaker, David Wasserstein is a rabbi, okay? He documents, right, how Islam saved Jewry, you know what I mean? Because unlike Europe, where European Christianity completely eradicated every pagan religion that existed within Europe, and the ones that survived this, this annihilation of culture and Christianization of Europe, like the Jews, were treated like crap for many, many centuries. Um, however, if you look, and this is what Wasserstein talks about, um, in the Islamic civilization, you, you, although you know it, it, it wasn't the, the Islamic civilization didn't treat its Jewish citizens, you know, like 
uh, uh, extremely well or whatever, but in relative respect to the time, Jewish people were allowed to have contain off, like positions of government office all the way up to advisors of the caliphs themselves. There was the Jewish Academy of Baghdad, which was the center of all Jewish uh, learning once upon a time. And there was a rich community of Jews throughout the Islamic civilization. Even in Ottoman Palestine, uh, there is this thing, if we could go to the next um, uh, slide next to, it's called Hakam, Hakam Bashi. Okay, so Hakam Bashi is, and you can look at this for yourself, it was the autonomy that, that the Turkish people gave uh, Jewish people within historic Palestine. They, 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 they had autonomy over their own religious affairs and laws and everything like that. They weren't subjected to Sharia law and nor were the Christians. In fact, if we can go now to the Ashtanami of Muhammad, the Ashtanami of Muhammad, if you go through this document and you just scroll down a bit, this, was a, this is a document that was ratified by Muhammad and written by his cousin Ali. Uh, it goes in extensively about how uh, Christians are to be protected throughout the Islamic civilization. It spells out our rights, our, um, uh, our protections, um, and it calls uh, is um, it calls people apostates should they disturb us it should that we should not be subjected to tax we should we should not be um, disturbed in our uh, practicing of Christianity um, and it's something which most Muslims and Christians even um, Arabic ones don't don't um, don't know about but it's 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 a it's a very fascinating piece of evidence and it was the basis of coexistence throughout the the, the Islamic uh, civilization. So what happened um, pretty much after the Balfour Declaration was when um, uh, Islamic civilization mentalities flipped from being tolerant of its minorities because like all throughout the civilization you have like the Maronites of Lebanon, the Copts of Egypt, the Orthodox of Syria, these Christians in Iraq. You see pockets of these minorities all throughout the Islamic, all past the Islamic civilization, whereas you see none of that in Western Europe, right? Um, so, so when did it flip? It flipped after the Balfour Declaration, when England made it policy and the San Remo Conference, when it was made policy to establish a Jewish country on top of a land that was 92% non-Jewish. You know what I mean? And without any plan or, or, or uh, um, program to, to incorporate these non-Jewish citizens into, into this country. So um, that's when things became hostile. So really, you know, Islamic mentalities and extreme Jewish mentalities and both have only really been at each other for the last hundred years. This, this wave, and, and it, it's, so, it's, it's just sort of been escalated. You see atrocities happen like the Farhud and the Ujda, where uh, the Jewish uh, populations of those Arab um, countries uh, were expelled, but they, they were expelled because of two things, right? First of all, in 1944, Ben-Gurion made what was called the One Million Plan. I should have put a link up there, but it's called the One Million Plan, where he said, okay, we're going to conduct high-level search and rescue missions to encourage, because what, what, what is this conflict about? Demography. How are we going to increase our demography? Well, let's bring all, everyone back into the, let's bring back into the land to boost that number as much as we can so that we can uh, vote in a Jewish government. See, the, the, the dirty P word wasn't Palestinian, it was plebiscite, you know, because they didn't have uh, enough people to form a Jewish plebiscite that would vote in a Jewish country. So here we have the One Million Plan in 1944 that called upon uh, that, that, that Israel sort of conducted or the, the Jewish forces that, that be, Zionist forces that be, conducted high-level search and rescue operations, encouraged these Jewish populations in Arab countries to return home. Naturally, Islamic civilizations around them felt paranoid, you know what I mean, who were spies, who were not, and a lot of innocent Jewish families in that were slaughtered and kicked out. And it is unfortunate that that has to happen you will see this marketed as a population swap. You know what I mean? By the other side, you know, well, the, the, the Arab countries kicked out the Jews so, and we kicked out the Palestinians. So, you know, that's a swap, right? Again, that is something which is deliberately meant to mislead you into understanding the nuances of, of, of what actually happened. Um, so now that we have touched on um, some history, we've touched on demographic reversal being, you know, the root of the problem. It still exists today. Israel cannot Israel cannot go and annex the West Bank and Gaza. Why? 
because out of 8 million, 6 million of its population is Jewish. 2 million of its population are Arabs, right? Former you know, Palestinians that have Israeli citizenship. Um, and then you have approximately 5 million in the West Bank and 2 million in Gaza. So what happens if all of a sudden we, every Palestinian gets an Israeli citizenship? It wouldn't be a Jewish plebiscite anymore. It would be like a 50-50. Arabs would probably even outnumber Jewish people. And then what's the next thing that we're going to do? We're going to vote in an Arab prime minister. We'll vote in an Arab government. We'll change the coat of arms, change the flag. So th there's the, 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 that's why they can't just go and annex everything. Demography has been the issue and it still is the issue today. And it's, and it's exactly what uh, some people on the other side that are extreme and anti-Palestinian want to do to East Jerusalem is to increase the demography of Jewish people and reduce the number of Arabs into a manageable minority. So, you know, um, where do we go from here now that we have relative context in the past? Do I want to demographically replace uh, Jewish people because they've demographically replaced us? No, I can understand why some Palestinians that have lost family and have suffered, you know what I mean, tremendously at the hands of the Sinus Project to want to be able to do that. But is that something practical? You know what I mean? So, so what, what, where I want this to go um, now um, is that um, we need to start, in order, to, in order for things to move forward, we need to have some first principles. I think Palestinians are united. We know what we don't want. We are not. We are united behind what we don't want. We know that we don't want checkpoints. We know that we don't want inequality. We know that we don't want um, occupation and oppression and all this sort of stuff. But we, we we don't know what we want after that. We're divided: one state, two states, confederation, federation. And I believe that uh, even though that it's not possible to achieve something like this whilst being uh, occupation, it is important to keep a light shining at the end of the tunnel that Palestinians can work towards. You know, if, if, if there is a clear idea of what I want my future state to, 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 to be, and I have a clear idea as to what it looks like, I can plan better. I can be more strategic about the steps that I need to take to make that dream into a reality. And, and one of those things is, is, is not, it's, it's, it's not revenge, it's, it's reconciliation. And it starts with reconciling with the people that want to reconcile, the non-Zionist Jews, uh, the, the Jewish people that, that are um, aware of Palestinian grievances. And it's about talking to them, understanding them, understanding where they're coming from. But it doesn't just stop there because when nothing's gonna change if we convince the people that are already convinced we have to convince the people that aren't convinced or the people that are sitting on the sidelines or just I don't know anything about the conflict to tell them, hey, look, this is not a religious issue. It's about demographics. We have a problem here. This is not like any other problem in the world um, because uh, to a lot of Zionists, the, 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 the idea of a Jewish state is the, is the only thing that they, they would accept. They, 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 they wouldn't want that they will hear the term binational state as something which is inherently anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic. Two reasons. First reason is because a binational state literally means the end of Jews' self-rule. The, the Jewish people have this thing called galut, which means living under someone else's occupation. And the whole idea of Judaism is to end galut. You know, it's 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 to end galut. It's to be in a situation where we rule over ourselves. And some and for a lot of people in this camp, a binational state doesn't cut it. So where does that leave us? So two states, federation, confederation. I don't know. And personally, I don't think that we can uh, uh, put a solution given the current climate of attitudes. But So attitudes need to change in order to give fertility to an actual solution to come. Um, however, we know what KPIs we want, right? And that's something that we could unify uh, behind. Like, it, for example, uh, the, the, the right to... Um, uh, have our own currency, enter into um, diplomatic uh, relations with other sovereign states, the right to control our own borders, um, freedom of movement, just the basic things that any other per that any other group of people that have a, a state want. Um, the, the creation of the state of Israel shouldn't mean the destruction of the state of Palestine, although that is what it has meant up until this point in time. Um, 
So uh, in order to, to come up with a solution, it has to be something which is moral, practical and clear. And I feel though as if we have a lot of unit, like I said, we have a lot of unity behind what we don't want. It's time that we have, we, we create unity as to what we want um, past this. So uh, that, that, that's something that uh, we can expand on um, uh, later. Uh, the first step, I guess, to agree with people that aren't in the same camp at you is to outline first principles. Because like I said, it's about convincing the people that aren't convinced, not convincing the people that are already convinced to, to ex expand our change. And to give you an idea of what first principles are, for example, if I, I'm a Christian, let's say I'm a religious Christian, I want to promote Christianity, okay? Um, the way that I would go about discussing this would be completely different talking from uh, when I'm talking to a Muslim as opposed to talking to an atheist. Because talking to a Muslim, there are some first principles there. We both believe in God. We both believe in the divine birth of Jesus. We, you know, we, we, um, we, we both believe in prophets. There are some... There are some first principles that we can output on the line and discuss it. Now, the way that I would talk to an atheist, if I go here, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's God and everything like that. It's not going to go down the same. So in order to, to for everyone to get on the same page and to, to spread awareness of Palestine and to create change uh, with people that identify as um, Zionists is to outline these first principles. You have to acknowledge the right of Palestine to exist. You know what I mean? Uh, we both we have to acknowledge both of our rights to self determination, both of our uh, identities. Um, it, it's 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 literally just mutual respect, um, and that's what has been um, that that's that's what has been missing as people become further polarized and polarized into their own echo chambers. So, I think uh, I'll I'll open the floor because I can I do tend to ramble. Um, and uh, I'd like to invite uh, any questions if necessary. Um, thank you again. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jason. That, that was great. Um, and your, your discussion taking us right back over 2000 years of history reminds me of a, um, a point made in the book, Zionism, False Messiah by um, an Israeli, I think he's Israeli, um, scholar called Samuel Weinstock, which he, 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 he makes the point that the closest living descendants of the original uh, Jews of Israel, of course, are contemporary Palestinians. Not that ancient history solved these things, and I, I thought it was great the way Jason connected history with, with, with contemporary politics. Now, just for people who are uh, viewing this via the Facebook live feed, if you'd like to ask a question, just put that in the comment section of, of Facebook live feed. I'll, I'll have a look at them and, and attempt to um, uh, relay them to our three speakers as, as best I can. Before we, and when we do do that, I think we'll probably take uh, three questions at a time and then let the three panelists respond, respond to them um, as they feel appropriate. The other thing I should do as well, just before we get into that, is um, it's it's great to have discussion, but we also need to think about how we contribute to the struggle for, for peace and justice going forward. So if you're new to Green Left, I certainly encourage you to like our Facebook page, go to our YouTube uh, channel where this video will be edited and, and put up and you'll be able to share it around, um, which would be great. Visit our um, webpage as well, greenleft.org.au um, and become a supporter. Um, we really encourage you to do that. You do that for five dollars a month. Also, for people um, in Western Australia, um, you should support and be active with Friends of Palestine. Um, so, if you go to their website, FOPWA, if you um, do a search on that, and I should, I just want to make a point of mentioning that some of the themes that we're discussing this afternoon are going to be expanded in, in detail um, on Thursday, fifth of July, six thirty p.m., when Friends of Palestine WA is holding a lecture at the Murdoch. Lecture Theatre at the Arts Building, University of Western Australia. You need to book tickets for that event, so go to the Friends of Palestine Facebook page or web page and follow the links to, to, to get the tickets. Okay, so we'll go on to questions now. Just let me bring up the Facebook feed um, and see if there's any questions there. Um, now, does anyone in, in, in the room like to ask a question? Um, the, the mic is kind of multi-directional, so 
Um, if you ask a question, people online will hear it. Um, any questions from the floor to start off with? I have, I have a question for whoever. Um, you, you talk about the, uh, the way forward as first agreeing amongst each other. Uh, can, you, can the speaker say something about the arguments that the Palestinian people have with, amongst themselves, so Hamas against the uh, Palestinian Authority and maybe some other groups? Okay, thanks very much for that. So, so if, if, in case anyone online didn't quite get that clearly, so that was a comment by the panellists on debate and discussion within the Palestinian movement, Palestinian community itself, on, on, the, on, on the way forward. Uh, are there any other questions from the floor here? Yes, on that, um, when we first speakers mentioned about the Palestinian Authority, um, is that separate from Hamas? Or, because I know Hamas got a, a good vote, they, they voted Hamas in. She seemed to be uncertain about how the Palestinian Authority was handling things. I was a bit confused. Okay, thanks for that. So just in case people online didn't get that, just uh, a question if the panelists could explore the differences between the authority governing Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Uh, is there another one? Yeah, uh, it's Rob speaking. Um, congratulations to all the speakers on your very uh, inspiring deliveries uh, and very informative. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, Vivian, I think, mentioned the IRHA definition of anti Semitism. Uh, so cool. Uh, completely agree with her that it's not a legitimate definition. I mean, for one thing, seven of its 11 examples of anti Semitism talk about Israel rather than about Jewish people. So that really tells you where that definition is coming from. It's really directed against support for the Palestinians. But um, is anybody aware uh, of a new definition of anti-Semitism called the Jerusalem um, Declaration of Anti-Semitism, which have come out in the last few months, and which uh, quite a number of people who are supporters of the Palestinian struggle have said that while they don't think it's a perfect definition of anti-Semitism, they can nevertheless live with it. Does anyone have any knowledge or experience of that? I haven't read it myself, but if you know something about it, do you think it's uh, a, a definition which which is basically more helpful to getting a resolution of this this terrible problem, this, this struggle for, for liberation for the Palestinian people, and, and of course for reconciliation between the Jewish people and the Palestinians? Thank you. Thanks very much, Rob. Rob's fairly close to the microphone, so I'm hoping people online, including the panellists, heard that. So there was three questions. So I don't, the panellists shouldn't feel like they need to answer all of, address all of those three questions. If, if, if they don't want to, they can address as many or as few of them as, as they like. But we'll, we'll go in the, in the order that we heard the, the panellists previous, previously. So, uh, Samiha, did you want to address any of those three questions? Uh, I can talk about the... Uh, uh the second question, because that was a point I, I brought on, uh, sorry. So I, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, the point I brought on uh, PA, and I think the question was, uh, what's the difference between Hamas and the PA? Yeah. Yeah. So I, okay, I think at the moment, uh, when I talk about the PA, the, the Palestinian Authority uh, as a structure, we are talking about the, the 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 regime that has been in place since 1993, since the Oslo Accords uh, uh, were in place, and in which you know the Palestinian Authority took over the uh, basically the responsibility of. Uh, um, I think administering the Palestinian population within the West Bank and the, Ga the Gaza Strip. And at the same time, we're given the promise of a Palestinian state based on the idea of negotiation. Um, that happened 27 years ago, uh, 27 years ago, I think. And uh, so far, we haven't engaged in so much negotiation with Israel, you know. So when we talk about, like, you know, talking and starting conversations, whom are we going to talk to? I think this is a question that we really have to, to think about at, at the moment when we talk about conversations with, with Israel. It, the, fact, the fact we have we've spent uh, a quarter of a century actually trying to initiate conversations with Israel. Uh, most of us here in 
like you know, my mother, for example, went on um, on 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 trips as a as a child with the, with the Jewish Israelis uh, in uh, in Tel Aviv and Nazareth, and they spent like they spent a week together in order to like you know talk about their mutual humanity. But at the same time, my brother is now living in Gaza in in a cage while uh, you know the the the, uh, the other Israeli uh, the Israeli kids didn't have to do that. So, um, you know, so, uh, yeah, talking about the PA. Uh, now, what I think uh, Hamas is, I think Hamas now constitute, constitutes part of the PA, whether we like it or not, given the fact that they were brought to government in 2006 uh, through the uh, elections that were part of the uh, Oslo Accords, you know, uh, regime. Whether, whether Hamas likes to acknowledge that or not, but they have become part of the uh, kind of the, the alternative administration that uh, uh, has been put in place to preserve the status quo and to control the Palestinian uh, 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 population within the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. Besides the fact that Hamas in, in the 80s have been, have been uh, very, uh, uh, you know, um, and, you know, a political party that, that has lots of popularity with the, the, the Palestinian uh, mm -hmm. population, you know, whether, whether that is the Gaza Strip or the West Bank. And I know that as activists, we don't like to talk about that, given what Hamas, how Hamas is perceived in, in the West, but Hamas still has some sort of popularity. Uh, whether they have the legitimacy, this is another question, because... Uh, there hasn't been any elections since 2006. And uh, for example, in Gaza, uh, I'd say 50% of the population are under the age of 25, which means that 50% of the population have never had the right to vote. Actually, 70 uh, about 70% of those are under the, 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 the age of 14. So, you know, you could you could uh, talk about the idea of legitimacy and whether Hamas would be in power again if there was uh, another election and so on. But um, I think the, the 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 fact that Hamas is in power now in Gaza, um, you know, as, as activists, we like to talk about the 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 the, the 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 way that Hamas also is part of the uh, has become part of the PA structure, which controls the population of Gaza in one way or another. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I know that we all disagree, you know, uh, on the PA and Hamas and so on, but you know, I think different people have different opinions. Uh, thank you very much, Samia. Uh, Vivian, would you like to pick up any of those questions? Well, I think in, in relation to the IHRA definition, um, something I just sort of want to help and why it is such a problem is because it's got the examples that have added to the original definition passed by the IHRA. And it's all a lot of repetition. They're trying, the movement's trying to understand um, anti Zionism as anti Semitism. And, and um, you know, the, oh, well, you know the, the people have the right to self determination completely ignoring the colonialist and dispossession, um, which is the, the political designers project and, and the Jews are to have um, supremacy in the sense that um, their, their needs and aspirations have a priority. And um, so it, it is, it's a very um, ambitious kind of document. And the Jerusalem um, um, declaration goes straight against that. Um, the the only difficulty i mean there are two difficulties with it you know um anti-semitism is a particular kind of racism and i don't think we should separate it out so distinctly from anti-racism in general why don't we have an anti-racism declaration and um then um anti-semitism which has its specifics just like islamophobia has its specifics um the, 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 these things uh, should not be separated out the issue is for, for all of us subject to racism of whatever kind to, to uh, link together and fight it together. And th this thing of looking at anti-Semitism as a special thing, um, I mean, it, is, it has it's got its own special, specialties and its histories and so on. But um, it, it again, it isolates Jews once more. Um, and um, I think that's a problem. 
and like Zionism isolates Jews. Um, I, I'd also like to I could give a bit of further clarity on the um, the differences between um, like the PA and um, and Hamas, um, and also the, the to address the first question, the sort of split between um, uh, the two thoughts of what a solution should uh, should look like. Um, so um, the PA, you can think of it as a vehicle created by the Oslo Accords. Um, that essentially um, has the PLO in the driver's seat. And so the political parties can be into, like, uh, like it's the PLO are uh, the political party that has, uh, that is driving the PA, which is just the vehicle that is outlined, you know, within Oslo, what it can and can't do. And it can't really do that much. Um, it's probably the, the city of Melville probably has more uh, uh, rights than, than the Palestinian Authority. Um, and uh, if, so, that's, so if, if Hamas wins the election, that will essentially be the, the, the PA, um, if you like. So it's just the vehicle. Um, when it comes to a split between um, Hamas and the PLO, um, so in 2005, when Ariel Sharon unilaterally, unilaterally withdrew from Gaza, um, it is often used as a talking point to be like, look how magnanimous Israel is. Like we withdrew from Gaza and you know what we get in return? More rockets from Hamas. But they don't tell you what was going on in the background. Now, you see, um, during that period of time, you had the PLO uh, entering into negotiations with, um, uh, with the Israeli government. And because the Israeli government weren't getting them to play ball with them, what do they, what do they do? They know, the PLO already know that Hamas resent the PA for entering into negotiations in the first place. And the only thing that is preventing Hamas operatives from uh, taking over Gaza was the presence of the Israeli military. So in, uh, in a move, right, to, in order to destabilize Palestinians and to create further division for Palestinians, uh, Israel withdrew its troops, right? And then what happens next is you see Hamas operatives throwing PLO off the tops of buildings, and then they get, democ then they get democratically elected. You know what I mean? So Hamas, Hamas was democratically elected in Gaza after they threw members of the PLO off the tops of buildings. You know what I mean? Because the only thing preventing uh, them from attacking the PLO uh, was the Israeli president's presence in the region. And you see when things happen, sometimes when people act unilaterally, it can, it, it can create more damage. But they, the, and if Hamas didn't react with rockets, then we could have probably seen withdrawals from the West Bank too. But the, the, the thing is, the, 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 the other side has been constantly strategic. It has actively been working, uh, uh, actively been working to destabilize Palestinians and to create division uh, uh, among us. Um, and now that has sort of organically evolved into the mess that it has become today. And now you're seeing something similar, but from the, the PLO side, where you have an activist being silenced uh, arrested and killed, you know what I mean, um, over these differences. And you bet that that is going to be used by people who are against us to create further division between us. So we sort of need unity now more than ever. We need to call out the mistakes of Oslo because it is the Oslo Accords that gave the green light to Israel to build settlements in Area C. Like we signed on to that when we shouldn't have ever signed onto that. Some Palestinians call it like the second Nakba, you know? So, so there are a lot of things that we need to take a step back. Like I said, we are very, very unified and strong in regards to what we don't want. Um, and that's, that's very easy to become. Um, and which leads me to the second uh, point to address the first question, um, which is what are the key, what are the key different, the two camps that exist within Palestinian consciousness? First one is a two-state solution on the 67 borders, compensation for the um, 1948 refugees, which I guess includes uh, my family, um, before America's policy became even anti more anti-Palestinian, 
um, it actually um, uh, it fronted the it, it was it was the driving force behind the UN resolution 194 which also Australia signed onto, which called upon Israel to resettle all the refugees back into Israel and compensate, um, to give compensation for them. That at the time was rejected by the Palestinian leadership because they didn't want to concede that, you know, um, the, the whole thing should be Israel, but has been picked up again and used in negotiations between, hang on a second, you actually supported this once upon a time, you need to resettle us now since the two-state solution is obviously unviable, unlogistical without having to uproot um, tens of thousands of settlers. I mean, I think it's it could be uh, in the hundreds of thousands now. So, that's so the other camp um uh the other camp of a solution model is the one state solution which is a united federation uh with designated zoning for jewish majority and palestinian palestinian majority areas um uh, with local representation and uh, full municipal autonomy for both sides uh, shared arrangements for defense and trades, right of return for all Jewish and Palestinian diaspora into designated population zones and a shared capital in Jerusalem. Uh, my personal opinion is that this version of a solution is probably more likely to, to is more practical uh, than the first, because the first on 67 borders, then you have to do with, oh, what are we gonna do with all the settlements? Are we just gonna uproot um all these people and and send them back to the other side of the border a little bit logistically impossible and they won't go willingly so so i guess it it, it sort of narrows down the options a little bit but none of these options aren't good with the current climate of attitudes it is time to develop um, our collective attitudes to be more um to to be more uh solutions based but to never stop advocating for the end to the things that we don't want right which is i guess is what uh, the vehicle of uh, bds for so and, and and what bds means to palestinians right uh bds is literally the only non-violent means of resistance that makes palestinians feel like they're doing something because it, it changes people's minds it raises awareness it, it it creates anxiety and all that sort of stuff the the only the only thing that it the only thing um that it hasn't done is stop settlements from being built in the in the west bank so it clearly although it is important it is not enough we need to be doing more we need to be constant constantly revising developing our strategy to spread palestine we need to normalize palestine and especially within Zionist um, within Zionist mentalities, because just as the dead person recognizes the right of the alive person to exist, the uh, the living person now must recognize that the dead person has the right to become alive. You know what I mean? So, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. We, can I, we can I add a comment? Sorry, uh, can I add a comment to Jason's? Uh, I just yes. Go ahead. Just, yeah, because I, um, yeah, um, just uh, with your talk about the PLO, because I, I don't know if you know about that, Jason, but there has been a call uh, that uh, to revive the PLO, to revive the PNC and so on, and Palestinians uh, within uh, within Palestine, as in uh, people like Hanin Zabi and other parliamentarians as well have been, have taken on, you know, this uh, initiatives of reviving the PLO as a structure, as a more uh, legitimate representational structure for the Palestinians. So I think the Palestinians within are already thinking of other ways, strategic ways in which they can uh, uh, claim uh, back that unified narrative that uh, will, uh, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, gets us out of this whole division about the PA and Hamas and who represents who and so on. I think we all are craving some sort of a, 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 a like a representation that gives honor to the kind of resistance, uh, grassroots resistance that we are seeing in Palestine at the moment. And uh, we are all disappointed with how the PAs handled it and how Hamas has handled it. My only point of disagreement with you would be with the with the fact that um, Hamas was actually 
uh, democratically elected in 2006. Uh, uh, there has been a democratic process that Hamas followed and they were elected. The fact that they were that that was not respected by the international community because you know uh, they don't agree with, uh, with with Hamas as a as a as a as a body that they can uh, talk to or interact to, and that has in many ways uh, 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 spiked the the, the 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 kind of the the most vi violent confrontation that the that Palestinians have witnessed in 2007 that we have experienced as Palestinians in Gaza and has led to Hamas taking over Gaza but i think that that the the, 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 the the i don't think that we as Palestinians need to undermine that that kind whether we are, uh, whether i agree with how democratic is an election uh, 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 based on the Oslo Accords uh, uh, is a different question as in like I do not believe that the whole as you said the whole vehicle is uh, uh, effective or uh, can represent me as a Palestinian or does represent my aspiration as a Palestinian for justice and freedom for Palestine then uh, that's a different question but I do think that uh, we really need to be you know um, yeah, we, we need to acknowledge the fact that Hamas was democratically elected in Gaza, in in in, in uh, you know in the elections in in two thousand six, two thousand six. Yeah. Indeed. I'll take some questions. Okay. Okay. So we'll just we've got a um, we've got some questions online. We've got a few queued up online. So we'll we'll go through them, and I've got one of my own as well. Uh, and we'll let the panelists respond to them and to, and to each other, which is which is really good. Um, and I think it's probably also worth, um, so if you'll forgive me for some editorialising, editorializing, it's worth us, um, uh, people who are not Palestinians, never losing sight of the fact in the, in the discussion and debate about the relative strengths and weaknesses and problems with, with Hamas or Fatah, is that our job as Australians is to provide solidarity to the Palestinian people. Um, and, 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 and it's up to the Palestinians to work out, you know, what compromises they're prepared to make, which way they want to negotiate their struggle forward, who, who, who are or are not their representatives. Um, our jobs, the, the job for those of us who are not Palestinians is to strengthen the hand of the Palestinians as, as, as much as they can, so they can make, so they're in, in the freest position possible to, 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 to make those decisions themselves. So we've got some, the, some of the questions that, that um, on the Facebook feed include uh, one from Dirk who asks, there seems to be have been a shift in public perception around the so-called complexity of the conflict in recent months. Do speakers agree with this statement? And and what's the cause? So do, do the causes, is, is this being, can this be just attributed to the recent events um, where there does seem to be a new awareness that the, the conflict is not so complex after all, it's, it's about people who've been violently dispossessed. Um, has, or has, has, has that been brewing for a while, uh, do you think? Um, now, we've also got a, a question from, from Barry who asked what Australians can do to support peace with justice in, in Palestine. And that sort of ties in with a question that I have for, for the panellists as well, is that Jason talked about the need for, you know, for dialogue for it, wherever you can find it. But it certainly, it seems like at the moment that um, within, we know there are some genuine Israeli peace activists, um, either there are even a very small minority of the peace movement in Israel that even rejects Zionism. But there, it, every from the outside, it seems that Israeli politics is moving to the right and getting more hardline and more violent and more racist. Um, and that, you know, if you're if someone's lying on the ground and you're standing on their throat and putting a, a gun at their head, you don't need to negotiate with them. You don't need to make make, make peace. And I mean, my sense is that probably that the shift. The shift will have to come internationally before significant shift happens within Israel. Um, before, at, at the moment, is you know while there's an unconditional pipeline of weapons and money flowing from the United States to, to, to Israel, Israel doesn't feel the need to doesn't doesn't feel the need to compromise. So, um, I'm wondering if the panelists agree with that. And then just to bring things back to Barry's question is, I'm wondering the, what the panelists think were what would be the the most important, or the two most important, or the three most important things we could get the Australian government to do. So, if if, if shifting the balance of forces in favour of the Palestinians, even just a little bit, you know, it needs to be done everywhere by everybody. Um, what what is it that um, if we could make the Australian government do do one thing, or two things, or three things that were useful for the Palestinians? What what, what would be your on, on your list? Is it is it diplomatic recognition of of, of, of Palestine? Um, is it a ban on military cooperation? 
Uh, is it uh, um, public endorsement of, of UN, rec, you know, UN resolutions? What do you think it would be? So I might um, I might take it in reverse order at this time. So we'll go to to to, to Jason uh, and then back to Vivian and to so, Samia. Cool. So uh, just the, the first question. Uh, so the first one was about the shift in public perception about the so-called complexity of conflict. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, the shift in public com it's, it's the conflict is becoming simplified. The more people, the more that people start. Uh, thinking that it's not about religion or difference of culture or whatever, and start realizing just it's about demographics, it becomes so simple because like it's it's a very easy concept to understand that if you're ninety two percent of the population and you have eight percent of the population that want to impose its rule over you, you're naturally going to be anxious about the, the, those people's intentions and what you're going to look up look what uh, what what your political representation, your legal status is going to look like under a country that doesn't account for you. <laughs> so so I think, uh, um, yes, it is becoming sim simplified when people start um, understanding the demographic ratios and the necessary demographic reversal that needed to take place in order cre to create a Jewish demographic majority in order to create a Jewish country. Um, so and uh, so that's, that answers the first question. I believe the second, qu the second question was, what can our leaders do or is that something? Yeah. What can Australia do? To oh, okay. Balance? What can Australia do to change the balance? Normalize. Okay. So we're already doing certain things. Like we already have in terms of, okay. So what can Australia do in terms of government or in terms of people? Okay. So in terms of people, normalize Palestine. Go. So you, you're, if you're, if you're already active in BDS and you, you're looking to, to increase, to, to do something um, in addition to that, then normalize Palestinian products. Go buy some Nablus soap, go find some Palestinian olive oil. You know what I mean? Like things like that help artisans, help small businesses like artisans um, um, uh, buy, their, buy their products or, or talk to people, have conversations. Like there's, there's so many different things. You can be as creative and as innovative as you want about your advocacy in terms of how you go about doing that. One thing that I'm trying to do is tell people all about Thai Bear beer. Palestinian beer. When I when people ask uh, ask me, oh, I didn't know there was such thing as Palestinian beer. I'm just like, oh, well, there you go. How many stereotypes does that break with one? You know what I mean? With, with one thing, and it's a very normal thing. What do Australians love? Beer. What do Palestinians have? Beer. Why can't we do something in advocacy through that? So get as creative as you like in terms of the people. And then what else can we do? Is we need to start go to 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 lobby our governments to stop picking. The, stop picking sides. Like, be on the side of peace. Don't, you, 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 Australia has always been staunchly pro-Israel, and okay, sure, our troops went over there to fight World War II, and there was, uh, uh, there's there's a lot of history and relationships, and Jewish people have contributed a lot to Australian society. But and, and it's even it's, it, 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 so there's like a strong um, relationship between Australia and Jewish uh, Jewish citizens and. Uh, and Israel, but that doesn't need that. But if, if if Australia had genuine interest in the future for Israel and the future for Israel's security, it would be on the side of peace. It wouldn't be on the side of picking a side to perpetuate the to, to perpetuate the conflict. And so, uh, even though, um, uh, uh, and so, I, I do hope that uh, the Labour Party's policy of recognizing the state of Palestine becomes a bilateral thing. You know, like it, it, it's the, there's the, the the people that are um, the people that are preventing this recognition from the most are usually in in in, um, uh, in the, uh, the the conservative camp, right? Conservatives have always traditionally been uh, pro uh, pro Israel, but it's those conservative thinkers that are just unaware of people like me, Palestinian Christians. They they have been sold. They are the, the they have bought wholesale for the last decade. This conflict is about religion, and that international jihad is is what's trying to destroy Israel. You know what I mean? Those are the people that you need to, you know, for lack of a better term, like uh, wake up you know, and be like, hey, hey, these are the people that we need to tell them that this conflict is not about religion. It's not about transnational Islamic jihad. It's about demographics. And when you put it, especially to conservatives, that this conflict is about demographics, 
then that uh, will will trigger things because you see across the you you see across conservative mindset in 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 Europe uh, and in America, but mostly in Europe. European conservatives are scared of the Islamification of Europe. You know that Muslims are pouring into their countries day by day. They're buying properties. They're creating mosques. They're converting our local people. And this this is an exaggerated thought that all Muslims want to create an Islamic caliphate in Europe. When really, there's across all the countries in Europe, there are only 55 million Muslims, less than like five percent of the total European population. And majority of Muslims are not uh, aiming to create a caliphate. You know, they're not saying. We, you know, in our religion says that God gave us the whole world and uh, we, we can come here. If you don't like it, you can either leave to America or leave to a, another place. But in the case of the Palestinians, you did have a group of people saying that we have a historic connection to the land. And despite you being the 92 percent majority, we want to create a Jewish country on, on, on top of it. It wasn't a concocted fear. It wasn't a, uh, a paranoia. It was just it, it was a reality that. Um, that Palestinians faced and resisted from the very beginning. And actually the first people to resist this project were Christian Palestinians. There are two newspapers that sort of form the backbone of the Palestinian uh, nationalism. Um, and those are called al Karim, uh, that was founded in 1908. And the newspaper Palestine, which was founded in 1911 by the al Isa family. Now, those two newspapers caught wind of those, the, the editors of those newspapers caught wind of the Zionist projects, caught wind of the proposals that Rabbi Chaim Simon documents about that started in 1895. And they tried to appeal to the Palestinian intellectual class saying, hang on, guys, wake up. Um, the Jewish people that are coming here aren't just buying land here just to live. They're actually buying land here to create a Jewish country in, in where we constitute the demographic majority. And the only way that they can do that is to eventually expel us. And then uh, come the Balfour Declaration in 1917, it confirmed all the fears raised by the two national, uh, the nationalist newspapers that the Christians created to the Muslim class. And then that's when Palestinian nationalism took a new edge of being, uh, you know, fundamentally anti the Zionist project, which was to literally demographically reverse us through way of population transfer. So, um, sorry, I keep going into history, but it's important. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Vivian, do you want to take up any of those points? Well, um, could you go over that first question again? There's one word I didn't catch in the middle of it. Okay, so Dirk asks, there seems to have been a shift in public perception around the so-called complexity of the conflict in recent months. Do speakers agree with this statement? Uh, and if so, um, do you have an idea of what the causes are? Oh, well, there's certainly been a shift, but I don't think it's about the, con the, con the complexity. Um, it's a, just a shift in perception of what's going on. That in fact, you know, the the, the, the Israelis are oppressing and and, um, and attacking, violently attacking the Palestinians, and it's, you know, the and why it's going on. I mean, I think in my talk I showed how this was has been a cumulative process over some time now, and um, it's it's like you know, it's a, the whole social process of change. It's like a great ocean with great waves, and at a certain point, it culminates in, in sufficient momentum and so you have change taking place like you did in south africa like you did in um, ireland and so on these these struggles are not come and come to a crisis or come to a changing point um at times that can't be predicted or necessarily explained it's not like heating heating um boiling a pot on the stove and when it starts to boil you can predict that but you can't do that with the social fabric but that's what it's about but it's not complexity it's a, just a, a different view of what the struggle's about. Um, now, the question of what Australia should do, I mean, you know, the Australian government, um, the, 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 we should be cutting um, military ties with Israel while, while it's um, violating industrial uh, and international law. Um, that's um, important. Um, I think that's a, a good first step. And given that violence and given that people are now aware of the violence, it's not such a long stretch. To actually campaign for that, and that's what the Greens are doing. Those are the among the Greens who who are, are, are fighting for Palestine. 
Thanks, thanks, Vivian. Um, that was very. I'm very glad you mentioned that point of uh, existing military cooperation with Israel. So it's not just diplomatic support, but it's military support as well. It might be small, small fry compared to the United right. States, but it's, but it's still real. Uh, Samia, did you want to address any of those? Points? Sorry, so it's just, it's, it's not just the, it's sorry, Vivian. It's about trade. It's about um, inter-university um, cooperation around military projects. Um, there's a, a much deeper military connection than we're ever told about. This is half the problem in this country. We don't know what's going on. And um, so, so these military ties and, um, are really important to address. Thanks for emphasizing that point. Um, Samia, do you want to address um, that? Just regarding the first question, I think I think uh, that takes us back to a point that Vivian said in her presentation, just connecting the uh, what what's the the mass protests around the world with with also a mass uh, 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 the mass protest within the. Uh, the Black Lives Matter, for example, and I think that uh, idea of like you know awareness about colonialism and race and so on is growing, and, and I hope that it is growing. And uh, and 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 understanding pal Palestine from that lens is is very important. Uh, is very important too. And I stress out the fact that you know um, mainstream media is not the only actor nowadays. With they are not the only people controlling the narratives. But we've we've seen uh, footage from Sh Sheikh Jarrah by two Palestinians, like uh, who live in Sheikh Jarrah and whose home are. Uh, uh, being destroyed, uh, be, you know, um, being threatened to be, uh, uh, they are being threatened to be displaced from their homes. Uh, these are Mun al-Kurd and uh, Muhammad al-Kurd. We've seen them speak uh, from their own platforms on uh, social media. On social media, so uh, I think you know that the, the narrative is somehow shifting, or or the 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 the. the uh, the Palestinians are finding more and more platforms to voice out their own story. And, and in, in that way, there is, a, a, as Vivian said, a, 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 um, sort of, a, you know, a change in the perception of what's going on. Because we're no longer seeing the, the, the news from, you know, seeing what's happening from the, the very short segments on ABC or, you know, um, uh, Channel 7 or 10, which has the same ongoing persistent story about what's going on they are interested in making that look like like a never-ending conflict or a complicating uh a complicated uh, story and so on but that's no longer the only narrative there so i think that's an important point too thank you samia um, so I think we've probably got time for one more round of questions. So um, we've got two, two on the, in the floor here uh, in the room, and one more on the line. So go, to Peter first. Um, I think the uh, uh, one fundamental part of the solution is going to be a socialist economy. You hear Western Australia and then Palestine and all over, you know, all over Australia, all over the world, particularly America, you need to. So it's, I think it's a fundamental point. And, um, so, so Black Lives Matter, instead of flashing with police, just turn that energy to, to the economy, solving the uh, problem in a socialist way. Uh, but it's the economy stupid, you know, it's the economy stupid. You know, transforming the corporations basically into community property and other elements as well. The socialist All right, might be yes, I'm not sure if people heard that online. So can um, can the Palestinians transform transform their economy? Um, yeah, to, and, a social, to a social economy. In, indeed, yeah, and, 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 and under and occupation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. And Janet? I was just going to ask, um, recognising its limitations, um, what have been some of the successes of the BDS? Can you give some examples of some, you know, the impacts that we've seen in, in Australia, for example, or actions that have been taken in Australia that reflect Campaign. All right, and so we've got a question um, online, um, which is, there have been recent splits in Israeli politics. Do they create any opportunities to advance the cause for Palestinians? Um, and I'll use my position of chair to throw in another question as well, which relates to the one that, that Janet rose uh, um, about 
what success has there been with BDS? Uh, one of the very conscious ideas behind BDS um, was was to replicate the success of the sanctions movement against South Africa, mm. to completely isolate South Africa politically, economically, and culturally, um, and to and to to do, you know the, the the liberation movement made it quite clear that one of you know. It, you know, even the sporting and cultural um, sanctions were important as well because they wanted to, to demoralise the apartheid regime um, and really underscore just how how isolated they are. Now, of course, you know, analogies they always they can only stretch so far. So obviously, the situations are um, aren't, aren't exactly the same, um, and there are you know there's different strengths and weaknesses for the Palestinian cause relative to to the South African struggle. Um, and certainly, you know, we're certainly not yet at, at a point where you could say that the, the worldwide movement of solidarity with the Palestinians, certainly not in Western countries, it might be different in the, in, in the global South, but in Western countries is not, is not yet reached the, the peak that the, the anti-apartheid movement did. So I'm wondering if the, if the panelists could address that question when, when looking at the success of BDS so far, also just consider a bit more broadly, what are the, what what are the key what do they believe are the key challenges for the international solidarity movement to take the next to, to, to step up to the next level? I know that's a big sort of that's a, that's a big question, so I only deal with it as much as, as you as, as you want to. Um, but I thought that might be a good way of of, of, of fin finishing up finishing up. So we'll um we might we'll start with Jason again and then we'll work back up, up the panelists. Yep. So I think um, to to enter Peter. Um, it is extremely difficult to build an economy under an occupation or under an apartheid. It, that, that being said, it doesn't mean that we can't assist or, or, or try. Um, finding, like, it, as someone in the diaspora, I don't want to wait until the end of the occupation before I start trying to find uh, avenues in terms of, like, an, uh, to, I don't want to wait until the end of the occupation before I start looking at avenues to increase our standards of living and increase our economy. Um, and uh, as someone in the diaspora, I sort of feel like a moral obligation to do what I can, leverage the fact that I'm in Australia to find markets for Palestinian products um, that are being manufactured at home because not only does that spread awareness, um, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's. It makes Palestinians feel dignified when they're not when they're working for their money, not just being given a handout. Um, so the other thing um, that I'd like to address um, was that your question in terms of what are the successes of BDS and then some of the stuff that we actually spoke about prior to this. Um, the successes, the primary success of BDS, I perceive it as um, being of spreading awareness. Um, spreading mass awareness to significant people of um, influence and public uh, figures from bands and artists and and, and as a like a, a um, ripple on effect you know what I mean people that follow these people uh, are going to become more aware of the situation it has been great um, it has been a great tool at putting pressure um, on Israel and pro-Israeli companies and artists and all that sort of stuff um, to, to do that. Um, the only, th the, in, in doing so, it sort of does two things though. Um, um, one, we can't use BDS as a sole tool to, to end the occupation, even though that was the main tool used to end the South African apartheid. Um, this is a completely different kettle of fish, although there are some similarities between South Africa and Israel. South Africa didn't have a military superpower backing it. You know what I mean? And and giving it billions of dollars each year. It's not the same beast. It's not the, it's, 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 uh, it's, and it's going to take a lot more strategy and, um, um, and uh, clarity and practicality in terms of how, how do we attack something? Because it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's like with, with, with South Africa, um, like I said, you didn't have the United States bailing it out of every move or supporting it with military. This is this, so so BDS alone is not going to be enough to to change. You know what I mean? Um, to, to to change Israel. Um, however, it is being essential in making um, the policies that discriminate against Palestinians 
um, known in in um, parts of the world that 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 wouldn't have known if it wasn't for for BDS. Uh, it has prevented. It, there was like uh, I believe recently Italian um, dock workers refused to load arms on a ship that was headed to Israel. So you know things like that really spread awareness. The, the only things that it, the only things that are that makes me anxious about um, this stuff, which is not actually uh, uh, scrap that. The, the sometimes um, uh, to the Zionist that is being brought up a Zionist that has been born within to a Zionist community, they will see the activities of BDS as something which is an inherently anti them. And then what their own echo chambers teach about BDS, it, it plays into the narrative of everyone's out to get us. This whole thing, they're, they're BDSing us, not because of the policies or anything like that. That's not even on their radar. They think we're, everyone is BDSing because we're all a bunch of anti Semites, let alone some of the biggest voices in BDS are Jewish voices. So so the, 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 my, my understanding is that the key benefit of BDS is that it helps spread awareness, it helps um, um, enact corporate change and even political change uh, on some levels. Um, um, uh, but the, the only thing that we need to be mindful of when we're pursuing this avenue is that we don't want to, we don't want to polarize the people on the other side because, like I said before, it's the people that aren't convinced that we need to convince. Um, um, but they're, they're, they're like with the exception of people that are just extremists and have a clear anti-Palestinian agenda. It's it's not those people that I give a convincing. You can't convince those people. It's the people that listen to them. It's the people that are born in the same environment as them and that are influenced from an early age to to thinking that you know um, Israel is this you know shining beam of light of justice and the only sanctuary from from the Jewish people. Um, and, and just shedding a little bit more nuance into the narrative that they've been brought up with by sharing our narrative of Palestinians about a narrative of demographic reversal narrative. Of, and so so I, I can, I'm going to catch myself before I start going on again, but, but yes. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jason. That, that, that was some great concluding comments there. Um, both those questions and some concluding comments from you, Vivian, would be great. I think she heard that. Mm. Say, you're Sorry. I can tell you that some of I'm talking about BDS and its impact on Jews. Um, I I can tell you that some of the Jews who were involved in organizing against the Marrickville um, Council resolution to to apply BDS says that today, um, although she doesn't agree with BDS, she wouldn't um, feel so against it as she did then product of the general climate of opinion that's changing and, and, the, and the way the perception of, of what Israel is and what the project's about that is changing. And I so I don't think we should be too nervous about that in implying and applying BDS. I mean, when when um, Israelis and, and Zionist Jews see celebrities saying they won't go to Israel, when they, you know, if we can begin to get to see Israeli ships being um, blockaded, for example, um, or, or various, or, or, or visiting Israeli cultural um, artists and so on. Um, given this changing climate, that will increase that that sense that Israel's on the nose. And I so I think BDS is an important um, um, strategy in relation to that. In relation to challenges to the Palestinian movement, I think it is the effort to portray it as anti-Semitic. I think that's that delegitimization effort, you know, if, if our side's managing to begin to delegitimize Israel, then I think we've got to uh, really fight these efforts to delegitimize the Palestinian struggle. And um, th that, that can be difficult, but it does require patient, persistent work and commitment. Thanks, uh, thanks, Vivian, uh, and, and, and thank you for your patient assistant work over the years. Uh, Samiha, um, can you address those, those points and um, give us your concluding remarks as well, please? 
thank you very much, Sam. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't add much to what Vivian and Jason said. I think they've just done a great job in, in telling everyone uh, uh, about the BDS and the importance of BDS and so on. I think uh, if everyone in the room, if you are you aware of the uh, boycott, divestments, and sanction Australia, because that's an amazing website and it can uh, it can. You know, it has a, a, a quite a lot of information about what the current campaigns uh, for for the boycott, divestment, uh, and sanction campaign here in Australia are about previous successes like like in Veolia and G4S and so on. And it's uh, it's important to see as well, like for example, with with G4S, it was it was for example shocking for me as a Palestinian to see the kind of the similarities between how G4S is, is used in Israeli settlements, but it was also used in um, in Australian detention centers and in, you know, um, uh, basically in, in prisons uh, with, uh, with the indigenous Australians as well. So to kind of see that striking similarities between Australia and uh, the, the kind of the apparatus of power and violence with that, that uh, function within settler colonial states like Australia and also like Israel was very empowering in, in many ways. And, and I think, you know, that that's, um, they do a great job of showing that in, uh, on the, on the website. So yeah, please go and do support the boycott and the divestment, uh, you know, campaign, because this is a, the Palestinian, it's a Palestinian cause, it, a call. It was, uh, 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 and as I said before, you know, solidarity needs to, kind of uh, admit the fact that the, the Palestinians have agency, they have the right to say what kind of struggle, what kind of resistance they want to use, and, and Palestinians uh, uh, chose BDS as, as, as a way of resistance as well. It could not, you know, as I agree with Jason, that it is not the main and the only way we can resist the, the occupation, because as Palestinians inside of Palestine, a lot of Palestinians inside of Palestine don't have alternatives to the Israeli products sometimes, so they can't do the boycott. But uh, of course, uh, it's it's a it's an it's an important uh, tool as well. Um, thank you very much for having us today. Thank you for giving us the platform to talk and to tell our stories and yeah, keep the conversation going. As Thank, thanks very much, uh, Samia and Vivian and Jason. You've given us really, 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 really interesting food for thought. Um, I think it's really incumbent on all of us um, who are solidarity activists, those of us who are not Palestinians, to recognise that the, the, the recent outpouring that we've seen on the streets in, in support of the Palestinian people needs to become a new high water mark. We can't go back to what we uh, are before. There's always going to be, you know, um, peaks and troughs in activity and in consciousness, but we need we need, we need need to capture something of this last outpouring and make sure we don't go back to what it was before. Uh, as Jason said, we need to normalise Palestine. We need to normalise solidarity with the Palestinians um, and really push it push it up to, to a new level. That's, that's, that's our obligation. And as Australians, as a country that actually gives material, uh, diplomatic, and as Vivian pointed out, military support to, to, to Israel until such time as we stop the Australian government, they're doing it in our name, um, and it's our duty to, to, to stop it. So there's, there's plenty of work to do. I know you all know that, and thanks to the speakers for helping inspire us to do that. Just tools to help you do that. So once again, if you like Green Left, you like what we do, like our Facebook page, like the um, our, our Green Left chat, um, YouTube channel, uh, the discussion that we've had today, that's going to be edited and put on our um, YouTube channel, and then you'll be able to share that around, so please do that as well. If you're in um, Western Australia, then you should um, do the same thing with Friends of Palestine. I'll just mention again, Friend of Palestine's uh, meeting on Thursday, 15th of July, 6.30pm. Uh, we'll get lots more tools as to, in, in, for, for the Solidarity Campaign. Um, and equally, as some here mentioned, um, go to BDS Australia. Um, to find out, you know, there's, there's, there's resources you can download and spread and all, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, and let's, let, let's keep it going. Um, and I just ask people in the room and also people on the um, live feed just to give a, um, a warm uh, round of applause again 
for Samir, Jason, and Vivian.